Hey, hey, Jordan, how's it going? Hey, what's up? Not much. Uh, just had something I wanted to check with you about. Do you want to you want to join me for a little walk and talk here? Yeah, let's let's uh, do a little walk yeah, and talk. Let's do it. Yeah. Okay. okay what's here up? Here we go. What's on your mind? Okay. Well, um, okay, something a little uh, alarming and concerning happened earlier uh, on Twitter. I was um, talking a little bit about Biden's student debt relief, um, the 10K student debt relief that they just announced. And obviously, you know, I'm a big supporter of the Biden administration. I mean, everyone is aware of this about me, but I was a little I'm a little uncomfortable with some of this stuff. I feel like it's a little bit of a slap in the face to people that have paid student loans in the past. And, you know, it's going to cause inflation. I don't know if we can afford it. There's the deficit. You know, all that stuff is a, you know, I want to be a team player, but that's a little that I find that a little troubling, you know? Yep. That's a great. I agree entirely. We yeah. just the fact that anybody at any point in time has ever had to pay student loans back. I think that's a great reason for not canceling yeah. any debt. So no, I'm with you is. there. That's just an unassailable argument, which I thought was going to be you know, mm-hmm. pretty non-controversial. But yep. I had a couple of kind of a couple of trolls in the comments to this tweet that I was doing who, who wrote this you and they had a screenshot showing that the insurgents LLC was a recipient of a fairly significant PPP loan from the beginning of the pandemic. I wasn't aware that we got that loan. Was that, what was up? What was going on with that? Was that you or, uh, PPP loan. Yeah. It, when was this? It was at the beginning of the coronavirus pandemic. Uh, if you'll recall, I, around the time know, we, st- shortly after we started the 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 podcast, maybe I was just kind of fucking around on the website. Um, okay, I got a bunch of money out of nowhere around then. Huh. That might have been it. Um, but all right, yes, I don't remember I mean, any of that coming in. So. I just yeah, I just kind of spent it on like. Mm. Office supplies. Oh, okay. So, like, pens, you know, copier, paper, and, you know, I that mean, kind of, like, off, it, staplers, office supplies, that kind of stuff? Or? Not, not exactly. So, I got, like, LaCroix. That's a, that's office supplies. We need that. We always need that. If everyone well, around the office has been saying, like, we need more... Key Lime LaCroix and I'm always like yeah I agree I'll, I'll get some um, I hear that a lot around the office so yeah I definitely loaded up on that so the, the, the like the six pallets of that um, that was that that's was, that's what that is those in the funds mm-hmm. the yeah. loading dock there mm. uh, the the jewel pods you know the, the jewel pod storage closet jewel pods okay Got that's like the vaping, those. the vaping stuff. Yeah, I just figured. I see, yeah. I see at least one guy around the office vaping, so I figured he should probably have some. Okay. Um, you know, just I want to think of everyone, just whatever their needs are. So, um, right. and uh, V bucks, V bucks, like for from the fort from Fortnite. Okay. Oh, are those in? Those are in Fortnite. I I didn't know. I, I just I just saw they were at you know the right. okay. cash register at the store and just figured we would probably someone around the office would probably n- need those. Um, See, so, you know, I'm just thinking of things that people around the office would would need. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, um, it was a little bit alarming. Um, it wasn't pleasant to be this huge. Uh, okay. On Twitter, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but ever, not very cool. Did you at least get anything good with the V Bucks? Any good skins or anything? Yeah, you know that uh, Slam Dunk emote that I like to use. Yeah, that was paid for by the government. Okay. Well, you know what? I was, I started off being kind of frustrated by this, but that that's actually pretty cool. 
It's pretty sick, right? Yeah. I haven't seen it in the store since, and it was just kind of a little You gotta nab thing. those when they're yeah, there. Yeah, you never know when away. they're gonna be back in the store. Hello, hello and welcome everyone. Hello, it's the Insurgents episode 116. I'm uh, Rob Rousseau here. What's up, Rob? Not much. Just <laughs> recording the podcast. Uh, Jordan, awesome. thanks for asking. Um, it's our first public episode in a little bit. We did put out a, um, a subscriber-only episode last week with uh, Jack Crosby. Which was a which was a great episode. Really good episode. Yeah, yeah. talking about uh, Ukraine and Russia. So uh, interesting to hear from Jack about that. Who's actually spent time in Ukraine, unlike a lot of like pundits that have been weighing in on this kind of thing endlessly. But it's our first public episode in a little bit. We're on kind of a little bit of a hiatus, a little bit of kind of like summer summer schedule, which I think we're going to be getting back into the into the swing of things. Um, I I had COVID um, a couple weeks ago. Which I mentioned in the yeah, last you still episode. Yeah, through it though. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Although I must admit, like, even though I did manage to do the podcast last week, that was like when I was slightly recovered. And and if if um, we had attempted a pod when I was actually in the in the worst stages of it, it would would not have worked out. Turns out, getting COVID, not pleasant. It was not Very enjoyable bad, whatsoever. Huh? It's really as bad as advertised. Yeah, someone. Someone tweeted at our like the podcast account or you and tried to blame me for it. <laughs> it's just like <laughs> no, I never had it. I've never had it. Don't don't rope me into yeah. this. Well, maybe we can still ex- explore some of that. Yeah, right. You're you're what listen, were you culpable? Were you responsible for it? We don't know. Okay, we should, maybe we Where should what? have that conversation now. Yeah. Uh I hope I never get it. I I would like to not get it i hear it's miserable i'm glad you're on the mend um but you said you're going through you're, you're still very exhausted i hear that's very common yeah yeah i'm uh energy level like my energy levels were already low as a like 39 year old man with a six-year-old who never sleeps or exercises was already my my energy levels were already low my brain fog was already high as well and now these things seems to have been kind of exacerbated a little bit but yeah, and thankfully I've, I have reco- mostly recovered from it, but definitely I would encourage anyone, you know, because I, I definitely found myself kind of suffering from that whole kind of COVID fatigue, kind of allowing myself to believe this kind of narrative about the pandemic being over. You see everyone else kind of taking masks off and it's becoming this kind of like a, this afterthought uh, would definitely encourage people to continue to taking precautions, uh, continue to take precautions about this and try to avoid contracting the novel coronavirus. It's really extremely, extremely not pleasant, especially if you don't have the like, the rich guy drugs that they give like Trump and Biden and those people. If you're just mm-hmm. on, you know, NyQuil and, and uh, Tylenol, uh, not 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 so good. Don't recommend it. So mm-hmm. definitely continue taking taking whatever precautions you can if you're one of those people that like me was kind of suffering from the whole pandemic fatigue uh, phenomenon yeah definitely it's just it's it's not over as much as people want to proclaim it as such and i just i don't understand the demand to make a bunch of kids go back to school without any precautions whatsoever that just does not make sense to me just, yeah whatever. just the I'm way just so, like, i'm so glad i'm not a parent yeah i mean definitely getting it has has really thrown into really sharp relief the the level to which the state both in Canada and the United States and you know a, a lot of other places basically except for you know China and Vietnam and some of these other countries um the way that st- that these countries have just completely abandoned any pretense of of taking any kind of precautions like the idea that there's no even masks, you know, that not having indoor mask mandates in grocery stores and things like that to me is just like unbelievable because it's just such a, even if it's a small thing that contributes a little bit to fewer people contracting it. I mean, you'd think we could maybe still stick with that, but no, we can't. It's, it's pretty, it's pretty weird and depressing and doesn't, as we've talked about a number of times over the last couple of years already, um, doesn't really bode well for the future 
possibility of any future pandemics happening. I don't really, I'm not really filled with, uh, with confidence based on our, the response that we've seen, um, and the way that we've just kind of tried to <laughs> just try to get through the pandemic with mostly vibes. I don't think that's going to, yeah. I don't think that's great public health policy. Um, how are you doing? You just had surgery. What's, yeah, do you I did. T- you could say you wanna, that. Do you want to, I know it's a kind of personal thing. Do you want to talk about uh, your medical procedure? You're flying high on painkillers right now. <laughs> I am positively zooted. Uh, as you'll, <laughs> yeah. you'll hear throughout yeah, brother. The, the rest of the interview, I am on so much codeine right now uh, because, yeah, I got a vasectomy yesterday and it sucked. Yeah. It sucked, man. I'd scheduled it uh, a few months ago and they give you the choice when you schedule it. They're like, do you want to be unconscious or do you just want local anesthesia i can't what for context i cannot watch medical shows at all okay i can't i can't do it if there's a scene in a show or a movie where you know there's like surgery or any sort of skin being cut <clears throat> weirdly with the exception of horror movies because i just like am able to kind of compartmentalize and see that more of like a thrill than just like a real life circumstance um but I can't, I can't do medical shows at all because I just like, it freaks me out. And I picked, uh, to be unconscious the day before my surgery was Wednesday, We're recording this on Thursday. So Tuesday, when they're calling to confirm, they're going through all the details and they're like, and you'll be doing local anesthesia. <laughs> like, whoa, what? Like, yeah, yeah. This is what you had selected, right? Ah. I said no. And they kind of like, like, you know, just kind of pressured me into doing local and at this point, I was just, they were trying to like talk me into it. It's, oh, it's not going to be that bad. It's not going to be that bad. It's okay. It's, it's, it's quick. It'll be fine. I'm like, oh, all right, fine. I just want to get this over with. Rob, it was not fine. <laughs> okay. Uh, <No. laughs> this, this, like the cutting and snipping sounds are going to like stick with me for a while. Just like very, right. very weird. I wasn't oh, like boy. looking, but like, dude, holy shit. It was like, yeah, unnerving. Uh, like, I think it's important if you don't plan on having kids or you're done having kids. Uh, it's important to consider uh, if you're in a relationship with somebody and they live in a red state, which I am, uh, it's especially important uh, because they don't have the same sort of access to abortion if something were to go wrong, which I've talked about in the show in January, it did. So like it's it's something I'm I'm, I'm glad I did, but dude, it fucking freaked yeah. me out i was like, trembling on the operating table at one point just like the noises alone were just freaking me out yeah that sounds extremely unpleasant it's good that you got it over oh, with though yeah and like the painkillers are a nice like compensation gift like i'll yeah, take it all right get yeah. a fun little weekend ahead of me a little trade-off just zoning out watching movies and zooted all right yeah well no it's it's good that you did that and it's i think it's good to talk about too because i think um you know, when it comes to birth control and stuff like that, it's something that I think men often are kind of just, we, we completely just outsource that to the women in our lives, which is not necessarily a fair uh, trade-off. Um, so it's, it's good that you did that. Definitely something that others should consider, I think, especially in light of all these kind of dark uh, political forces that are gathering when it comes to uh, reproductive rights and all this stuff. Yeah. Like, I don't want, I don't want, I don't want people to like get discouraged because my personal experience is bad. Like you can be, if you're if the doctor and the facility you're getting it at doesn't suck. <laughs> like you could just be unconscious and it's fine. But they like pressured me out of it at the last second. That's the part that sucked. Yeah. Um. Other like everything like the recovery. Like yeah, I was sore yesterday, but like I'm fine today. I worked all day today. Yeah. Um. It's it's fine. It's just a little uncomfortable. It's just honestly, if people on you know, it's just like you have really bad blue balls. Like that's what it feels like. Sure. That's well, it. I think the most important thing here though is this does solidify you officially as a male feminist ally. So oh, let's <laughs> congratulations to you. That's um, good. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna pat myself on the back. <laughs> like, yeah. But like look, if you're in a, if you're not gonna have kids and you can get somebody pregnant like that's just just consider it just yeah. just consider it it's the most effective thing a guy can do if, if you don't want to get somebody pregnant yeah there it is well it's good to it's good to be back doing the doing the uh podcast i'm glad you're recovering we're both recovering here 
Um, and again, to our to our audience, this is the kind of commitment that we have to creating this content for you. You know, it doesn't matter if you have COVID, <laughs> you have surgery, invasive surgery. This is what we care about: delivering this kind of delivering You're this. You're traumatized good stuff. by the yeah. sound of your your nuts getting snipped. <laughs> yeah, that classic experience that everyone's we've all been there. All know and relate to. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got a great episode coming up, folks, with uh, Andrew Perez of The Lever. Um, we had a, you know, it was great to catch up with him. Like I was mentioning, uh, we, we did kind of take a couple of weeks off and a whole lot has happened in those weeks, especially with like the Biden administration and some of the sort of moves they've been making. I was mentioning it in the show, but just like how a lot of the last two years has, has really looked like they were just doing nothing at all. And while some of the things that they have done over the last couple of weeks, I think could be definitely qualified as kind of watered down uh, democratic bullshit. It, it's not nothing. It's certainly not nothing. And they've been so, and Andrew is someone that was able to come and break down some of these things, talking about this student debt relief that, uh, that they're passing right now. We talked a little bit about that uh, um, inflation reduction act and what is in that and, you know, how that, whether that actually measures up to being kind of transformative climate legislation um so it's a really great guest to have on to 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 talk about these these uh big shit these kind of shifts that are happening yeah andrew's great and the, the stuff like the levers has had a really big week uh this week so definitely give them a follow uh check out their site um and and support their their work because it's a team of independent investigative reporters that's you know really time consuming it's a lot of work not every outlet even does investigative work and now you have an entirely investigative outlet that's fantastic yes and you know who else's work you can support is ours (laughs) the insurgents (laughs) podcast that you're currently listening to um i mentioned our our subscriber only episode last week with jack crosby uh you can get access to that as well as other uh exclusive uh subscriber only episodes that we do uh, by subscribing to the Insurgents podcast at theinsurgents.substack.com. You got it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can officially be a paid intern of the Insurgents podcast by subscribing for $5 or $55 annually. And then you officially become a paid intern. You join the paid internship program. What an exciting opportunity for people. This really is, Rob. It will take you so much farther in life if you join yep. our growing ranks of paid interns by going to theinsurgents.substack.com, subscribing to the show, supporting this now, you know, two, how many, 116 episodes yeah. now. Uh, you get a, you get access to our full back catalog of paid episodes with a ton of great guests and you have the distinct title of paid intern of the insurgents, which you can't get any other way. Exactly. So uh, I hope people do that. And let's get to our chat with Andrew Perez. Again, it's a really good one. He's going to be joining the show right after this. DC thing I've ever experienced in my time here. I went to a Nats game one night, and it was uh, like a t-shirt night, and it had Wonk on the back of the (laughs) Nats t-shirt that everybody got. Nice. Like, everybody who went to the game got this t-shirt, and it just had Wonk on the back. It's like, is this just a city that leans into that fucking dorky nickname? (laughs) (laughs) I assume you still wear that bad boy? Routinely? Oh, yeah. It's first date shirt. I got to take it out. Yeah. Let all the ladies know. <laughs> it's so, it's so I'm bad. I'm kind of dude. a numbers guy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, as you can see on my shirt, I'm uh, kind of smart. <laughs> yeah. It's the, it's the one city in the world where like talking about the West Wing could get you laid. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I wish I had a follow up, but I've never seen that show, which also like in my professional life has led to a lot of <gasps> really what? like you've never seen the west wing no yeah I, I mean i just watched breaking bad like i'm, I'm not a tv guy yeah. yeah 
Yeah. Okay. Does that mean I, you've I, never done a walk and talk? Like <laughs> we do. We do. Sometimes we do I, walk and talks through here. the insurgents' office. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. The insurgents' headquarters. Yeah. Okay. That's, We're talking about serious one. business. We Mixed with quips, one earlier. Though. Mixed with I funny fucked up quips. the PPP loan application, and yeah, we, we had don't need to, have to one even get into that. Yeah, what? yeah it's, that was big, it's a big ordeal. Yeah, oh, apparently man. you can't you can't get a PPP loan for V Bucks and Jewel Pods, but I didn't know that when I submitted the application. <laughs> oh man, you shouldn't you just shouldn't have marked that down. You, like this is for um, yeah. uh, just being too honest. Yeah, this is independent contractors. Like, didn't, I'm sorry, like, didn't everyone, like, every business apply for, like, a PPP loan? Like, it seems like it from all the threads on Twitter right now of people complaining about student loans and then having someone say, this you, under the post, indicating that they had their own <laughs> loans forgiven. Um, yeah. It seems like a lot of people did. The whole well, the whole right wing was basically running this big uh, <laughs> scam while they were simultaneously complaining about the pandemic and all the handouts and all that. It seems like yeah. every single one of these outlets were all... Uh, at the at that the good old government free money trough. Yeah, lo and behold, I think the that might be a little hypocritical about guy. this. It's like his big moment. Yeah, Matthew, Matthew Leslow was that his name? <laughs> I, I, you, I don't know. The oh question. well, you I was know, thinking Rob, he was the Riddler, the Batman character. The yeah, 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 there was yeah. a guy. There were infomercials in the states in like the nineties, uh, maybe early two thousands too, where this guy would wear like a question mark suit, like a suit just covered in question marks, and. It, he was like he was hawking this book that was basically like all of these ways you can get money from the government. I think it was a lot of like grants and stuff and like small business loans. And it was like a thousand ways you can get free money from the government. And uh, I've seen him around D.C. Like he still and he still wears that suit. Good for like, him. As nice. recent as a few years ago. Yeah. It's a strong personal brand. But that's this is you know, this is kind of what he's talking about. This is when everyone gets the free money. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't think there's any shame in it. It's just you shouldn't you shouldn't shame then people like other people getting loans. That that's that's the real problem in our country, right? Is the like like everyone's so fucking trained to to like look down on anyone else who gets money, like as they're also like, well, you got to you got to yeah. take the, get get everything you can out of the tax code. Like, yeah. Ugh. Yeah. The frustrating thing is just seeing conservatives and like conservative politicians and conservative outlets railed student loan forgiveness after they had their PPP loans forgiven. That's just, that's just, of course, yes. Yeah. They're hypocritical, but like they're not going to care and they're not going to change as a result of it. Yeah. But it is, it is fun to revel in it. I mean, that's, you talk about West Wing, that's the classic Aaron Sorkin thing, right? If we just expose their hypocrisy, that'll, that'll win in the marketplace <laughs> of ideas, but it, it actually has no effect on them whatsoever. They're just, they don't change the things that they talk about or their values or the things that they do. They don't care. Yeah. yeah I think to be, the right who already be, didn't yeah. care aren't going to care. Yeah. I think to be a, like a public facing conservative, you just have to like have zero capacity for shame or embarrassment or anything like that. Yeah. Just goes right, slides right across the, just goes right through them. Yeah, yeah, it's really like you're you're coming after me. Well, moving on. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the uh, the funny thing to see them, and then after I guess this topic, we should probably introduce our guest. But uh, well, <laughs> yeah, maybe we'll consider it. <laughs> the funny, funny thing I saw was Sean box, Hannity uh, format. Yeah, if you can figure out the the guest comment. Uh, uh, <laughs> um, th- Sean Hannity on his show was talking about his own staff that were going to benefit from it and trying to frame it as a bad thing. And he was like, now they're going to get $10,000 of radical Green New Deal socialism. <laughs> and like, <laughs> like, I just want to ma- I really want to see him like looking his staff in the face and being like, isn't it just absolutely terrible? You now owe Ten or twenty thousand dollars less to the government or to your loan servicer. I'm so sorry this is happening to you. Yeah, they have like they have to pretend to be mad about it to, just in order to <laughs> keep their jobs. Like, keep their job. oh, like, like that, like that Biden. guy on Twitter, like that guy on Twitter who was saying like, "Oh man, like I am not taking this student loan money." Like, do you actually even have that <laughs> option? Like, I thought it's just like automatically happening. Like, can can you can you say like yeah. no, like D- Joe Brandon, sir? Like, I, I I actually will not take this like automatic money. I'm writing a ten thousand dollar check to <laughs> the federal government in yeah. protest. Yeah. 
Which is like, where do, what do they ultimately believe? Like taxation is theft and they don't want to pay their taxes and they complain whenever they have to pay their taxes. But now they're going to give the government less and they're mad about it. So wh- what do they want? Like, what, what truly do they want? Uh, anyway, our guest today yeah. is Andrew Perez of The Lever. We've had David on a few times. Lever uh, or levernews.com. You should check them out. They had a huge story this week that Andrew wrote in partnership with ProPublica. Uh, we're happy to have you, Andrew. Thank you for joining us. Really happy to be here. Andrew, you're an investigative reporter, so you ask tough questions of your guests. Yep. So now it's our turn to ask you a tough question. Uh, we ask everybody who's uh, you're not exempt. Andrew, nope. are you a gamer? You know, some, sometimes I am. <laughs> the deep I, I, side. I, I, <laughs> well, I, I fall into these spells where, like, I'll game a lot. Like, I got, um, like, addicted to uh, Breath of the Wild earlier this year, and I just, like, crashed that shit out. You know, you, you just have to. Um, yeah. I, I did pick up the, the new Madden recently, uh, which I'm doing um, for self-care that my uh, therapist has prescribed me. So I think it's okay. Yeah. Of course it's okay. Yeah, uh, that's true. I, You're right. How, you know, I'm assuming like all Maddens, it's very, very different than last year. Is that right? It does. It, it honestly <laughs> does seem better, but I guess I didn't have the last one. I uh, So I'm like two Maddens ago and it, it does seem like a bit of an improvement, but I would not say that it's the greatest game ever. But it, it was cool, like, you know, playing online with my one of my friends from home uh, last weekend. So that was nice. Well, that's fine. I, uh, I I usually get one every couple years and then I also have I guess like some EA subscription mm. as part of Xbox Live and after a certain amount of time it just becomes free for me. Um okay. Every couple years I when I think the Browns are going to be good <laughs> basically I I <laughs> I buy it cuz it's fun to play that's the only team I play with. But well. I don't Ooh. feel great about playing with the Browns <laughs> this year, so I mean, yeah. no rush to get it. Yeah, yeah. Is is uh, is Deshaun Watson suspended in Madden? Like, can you unsuspend him? And would usually, you? Would you? Uh. Usually, they just put someone who is out, whether it's for injury or disciplinary reasons, at the bottom of the depth chart, mm. and then it's on you to make that (laughs) to make that moral decision or you have to work through that you know your trolley problem or whatever to uh decide where in the depth chart you want uh this person yes Uh, well good luck with (laughs) working through that yeah yeah just a lot of therapy a lot of you know meditation no fuck that guy he sucks i just don't i don't think i'm gonna get it this year yeah good good call but so, yeah. Soon he'll just be like on the Madden cover too. <laughs> the way the NFL operates, honestly, yeah, they just yeah. they just don't seem to care. Uh, but Andrew, on a serious note, you had a huge story this week about Bar Barry side. <laughs> I mean, the guy's name is one of the more confusing names I've seen in a while. It's B A R R E S I E D or S E I D. Yeah. Uh, He's an industrial magnet out of Chicago, oversaw what, from what I was told by Twitch chat this week, uh, a huge uh, and absolutely critical you know, power strip and energy uh, accessory company in the world of servers and computers. Mm-hmm. And he essentially gave $1.6 billion to Leonard Leo as the co-chair of the Federalist Society and instrumental in the Supreme Court's current composition. And this is really, really bad. I can't stress how bad this is for long-term conservative strength. But you blew the story story wide open. Could you tell us about this side fella, uh, where his money came from, um, and how he navigated our tax code to give this colossal gift to Leonard Leo, uh, basically tax-free? Yeah, yeah, 100% tax free. Um, so his name is Barry Side. Um, it, it does look like Bar, um, like the like Pilates exercise. Um, but uh, Barry Side is this uh, little known businessman in Chicago who um, has quietly amassed a giant fortune um, and become a prolific conservative donor behind the scenes. Um, 
he's he's always you know uh, really strained to uh, give uh, in uh, as anonymously as possible um, to these groups. Uh, really attempted to stay out of the public eye. I think he just didn't want to deal with press. Um, is really really what it sounds like. Um, <clears throat> but so uh, starting in April 2020. Um, he uh, he and like Leonard Leo, um, the co-chair of the Federalist Society, who has this dark money operation, um, they created this new uh, nonprofit trust. Um, it's called the Marble Freedom Trust, and they uh, placed uh, sides uh, company Triplight within this uh, trust, which then sold the company. And, you know, so Triplight um, was was like really successful, actually. It, it manufactures uh, surge protectors and electronics equipment, um, you know, for both kind of like at home and commercial use. They're like really, really cashed in on the digital age. And especially now as we have these kind of like, you know, giant data centers. Um, but so the company was ultimately sold for one point six billion dollars. And all of that money went into um this this trust uh, managed by Leo. Um, so if if side were to sell the company and then try to donate, um, you know, the proceeds to um, to a nonprofit, he, he would have had substantially less money, right? Like he would have been taxed on the sale by putting it in a nonprofit, which then sold it. Um, there was no tax event. And you know what it what he he probably avoided around we believe like 400 million in in state and federal income tax by doing it this way and that that's money that then goes just you know get gets to stay with this uh conservative nonprofit it's it's in effect a public subsidy um and so you know Leonard Leo he uh was uh Trump's judicial advisor he played he helped select uh, three of the six justices, uh, conservative justices under Trump. Um, and then he, he also apparently played a role in selecting uh, John Roberts and Sam Alito as well. So he's really played a played a role in, in selecting five of the six justices. And he's uh, real, real tight with Clarence Thomas as well. Um, and so he while he was selecting these judges, Leo has also run this dark money network that exists to uh, confirm those judges, help help lead their confirmation campaigns, um, help uh, re- like fund other conservative nonprofits that are boosting their confirmation campaigns. And his network also funds all funds the Republican attorneys general who then bring cases before the court. Um, like, for instance, the Dobbs v. Jackson Women's Health Organization case that overturned um, Roe v. Wade and thus invalidated uh, federal protections for abortion rights. Um, so, you know, they have this real uh, two-track strategy where they install the judges and then they bring them a caseload. Um, and so that's uh, <laughs> like, you know, right now, Leonard, Leonard Lee, who has done that with you know, maybe tens of millions of dollars every year. And in recent years, they have raised, you know, maybe around about a 100 or over a 100 million dollars kind of collectively. Um, but so we, we believe they'd raised like 460 million dollars overall, like during uh, since, since 2005. So, you know, now Leo has already successfully, you know, remade the Supreme Court uh, the outcomes are, are coming out of the court. Uh, the policy outcomes are really flowing out towards uh, towards the right. And uh, now he has a bigger pile of money than he ever has. And this is the biggest, I can't like stress this enough, this is the biggest one-time political donation in U.S. history. Like This is this is colossal. People, you know, people have given millions or tens of millions. And I think Sheldon Adelson one time gave a hundred million. Um if this is the biggest what like just to show how different and unique this is could you give us a little bit of insight if you if you recall what are some of the other ones that are that were you did know of that were the biggest uh, up until this point just so we know how different this is compared to the others yeah yeah well so we did a lot of digging it would certainly be the biggest political donation and then when you go towards these kind of 501c4 uh, political advocacy groups, you know, we, we call them dark money groups. They're really known as social welfare organizations under the IRS tax code. Uh, we call them dark money groups because they can spend money on politics. They do not have to disclose their donors. Uh, politics cannot be their primary purpose, but, you know, you can you can 
go all the way to the line. You can spend 49% of your, of, of your uh, expenses on politics. Um, but, you know, you can also then do kind of like conservative movement building exercises, um, you know, funding all these other nonprofits that are going to be bringing cases before the, the Supreme Court, et cetera. And, and actually the judicial advocacy stuff is not considered um, political. That is that is issue advocacy, um, like running a confirmation campaign. So we, we looked at um, other uh, 501c4 social welfare organizations, and there, there are some comparable donations here. Like um, there was there was a one point five billion dollar donation to one of uh, George Soros's groups that that acts as sort of a kind of feeder fund for uh, liberal organizations. Um, it's called the I think it's the Fund for Policy Reform, I think. Um, and then uh, then Sounds you know, ominous. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> if, if you want to make it. Yeah, it, it always can be. Um, and then we there was actually just reported um just just actually a week or two ago, um, the Center for Media and Democracy reported how there was this one point two billion dollar uh, donation, um, I think, in twenty twenty to this uh, social welfare or social welfare organization started by Chase Koch, who is the son of Charles Koch. Um, so those would be the kind of closest comps, and we definitely did a lot of digging on this. Um, this you know still blows those out of the water but th this you know this is this is definitely a kind of different situation you know like Barry side um is is very wealthy he is not as wealthy as uh as the coke network or the coke family or or soros he's just not but this is um you know he managed to package his entire business empire into the biggest one-time donation we've ever seen and it's you know, being put in the hands of a political operative. That's not really how the Soros network works. Like, it's just, mm -hmm. it's not it's so decentralized. Yeah, it is. It, this is much more centralized. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's being led by, and you know, this is worth emphasizing by a skilled political operative, right? Like, there's, when you think about it, like, you know, okay, there's this kind of liberal courts network that has, you know, started in the last few years to kind of act as a counterweight to, to Leo's network. Like they, they can raise money. They've raised a lot of money. They, they the influence does not compare whatsoever, and that's because uh, Leo is picking the judges. You know, he's picking the judges. They have this conservative judicial pipeline at the Federalist Society, um, and you know, you look at like, okay, what's the Liberal Courts Network talking about right now? They they're trying to push, uh, you know, expanding the the Supreme Court, like you know, an idea that probably seems pretty firmly rational in this in this day and age uh it is not happening in washington it is it is not a real conversation in the senate it is not a conversation in the biden white house all you've really heard is reasons why they wouldn't do that right there's no it's not a unified caucus that's that's really like what what is really supercharged the leo network and and it's just that they're working with a, a senate republican caucus that is also you know, completely down to uh, expand their power as much as they can and to use the judiciary to write policy. So it's it's a very different situation. You know, you hear these people like that, that's even kind of what Leo said was that like, oh, it's time for the conservative movement to join the ranks of George Soros. And like, like, I guess, you know, I guess that's an argument you can make. But like, you know, they, they have to also be like privately laughing about it because they know that they can do a whole hell of a lot more with this money than than Soros or uh, than, than, than these liberal organizations that are good at raising money ever, ever really have. It really, I mean, this whole story about this, um, about this massive donation, it really is a, a stark, uh, example, um, of just how fundamentally un undemocratic, uh, it is in the United States, you know, like not only do you have laws that affect, uh, you know, tens or millions of people, decided by these unelected judges in the first place but then you get into the political machinations and the big money that goes into putting these people in these exact positions and it's just i mean it's like it maybe it's an obvious point but it's just it really is a a real reminder um of how absurd the whole system is and how the how unrepresentative it is oh yeah ab absolutely i mean you know you're talking like this network has operated, like the Leo network has been operating and, and you know, 
installing judges and, and running these confirmation campaigns, running this campaign against Merrick Garland. Um, and like, we've never known to this point, really, who's funding it at all. It's like, you know, there's there's so much money that gets injected into the political system and into the kind of like advocacy system alongside it, um, where the public has zero idea who's funding it. And, you know, so many of these times it's also being run by these like front groups that that also have these like cheery sounding names or these like really uh, just anonymous names. And like, you know, in this case, it's been the Judicial Crisis Network for a long time has been the kind of central Leo node. Um, and, you know, I think if, if people see those ads, like there's not a lot of context to process it. Like people people really have no idea like what one of those ads actually is that they see on TV, what that ends with, um, you know, tell tell Chuck Grassley, like, thanks so much. You're you're being amazing. Th- thanks for blocking Merrick Garland. <laughs> like, there's just no context for this. Oh, and, and I mean, actually, this campaign was also like the American people deserve a vote in who uh, in in who <laughs> ends up on the Supreme Court in 2017. Like that was that was the the campaign. Um, and, you know, it sounds like nice and democratic, but like, no, it is a fundamentally anti-democratic notion um, completely. Just like the existence of these groups, the way they raise their money, the way they spend, the way that there's uh, that, the, that. I mean, the truth is they don't have to report to literally like anyone how much they're spending on these campaigns. They've they've kind of been kindly kind enough to just say it they've been like we're going to spend 10 million on on the brett kavanaugh campaign or 10 million on the neil gorsuch campaign if they didn't say that we would have literally no idea how much they spent at all there's just no regulation of of nonprofit spending unless it's on politics and even then it is exceedingly thin you know they don't have to disclose the donors even then they do a lot of trainings at work where our legal team will like show us all of these different ads and we have to vote on whether it's like an IE or non IE and whether or not we have to report it. And it gets so fucking confusing. And then I'll see some on TV. We, we get, I get hit with a lot of, I never see candidate ads in DC, but I get a ton of issue ads and they're like so cryptic and vague that like I, I do this, you know, for a while I was like reporting ads to the FEC as part of my job. And I'm like watching these things and thinking like, if I don't even know what side of the aisle this group is. It's like a vague thing about drug prices, but that could go either way. Like in the way sometimes the Republican drug ads are framed, it makes it makes you think that they want to lower prices. But really, it's just like throwing support behind this issue would ultimately help big pharma and i'm just like there's so many times i'm seeing these ads like what the fuck who is this <laughs> it's a group i've never heard of a group pushing an idea that or, or a cause that i'm not entirely sure what they're for and it serves a, you know a deeper purpose like you're saying andrew with the you know we deserve a vote on the supreme court to the untrained person that's like yeah i agree with that but ultimately it's because they wanted to block garland yeah it's, yeah. it's really really messed up yeah, yeah. I mean, the the, fr- the front group ads, you know, so some of the ones we've covered this at, this year, like just like outside of this, like you know, look at look at the the campaign that's been run against this like antitrust legislation um, by like these like front groups funded by like Amazon and Facebook and Google and Apple probably too. Like the, the, the their ad campaign is like is is like oh don't break our prime. Like if 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 senators were to were to pass this legislation that might keep um <laughs> that that might keep companies like Amazon from you know preferencing their own products in front of uh you know third parties that are using their their uh, third party sellers using their services then then it would actually break prime and like the <laughs> the the reason they're doing that is because they know that Amazon is actually like kind of kind of popular with the public because it's like ease of use you know you can really one-stop shop there but like it's just they're literally like framing this like antitrust legislation as, as if it would as if it would just gut amazon when it's literally just to keep them from just abusing the people trying to sell on their on their on their like program or, or, or on their on their uh website it's really it's really insane the funny ones from facebook uh that I saw over the past couple of years about uh, antitrust legislation and just general big tech regulations were uh, this like, you know, soft voice. We agree. The internet 
uh, is laws around the internet are outdated and we support regulation. And it was, you know, in part a, a PR attempt for Facebook to kind of try to recover its image because it had just been hit with years of negative stories and people were souring on it. But also it's because they want to be part of that crafting process. They want a hand in shaping those regulations because they want it to be favorable to them. So to the public making it look like, oh yeah, we support this. It's because they want a seat at the table. We'll even help. We'll even help uh, we'll provide our experts for it. And it's just like it's it's so it's so deceptive. Oh yeah, I mean, can you imagine what a what a Facebook approved bill would look like just to regulate the internet? I just yeah. I just don't oh want to I I don't want to know that information. <laughs> One of those examples where yeah, it's definitely the. The private industry chose time and time again that it knows how to get things done quickly, efficiently. <laughs> so I, just, this I, just, is our I don't see the problem. Yeah, we'll exactly. Help you. Yeah, and look, you get great information on Facebook. Like, and, and anyone knows yeah. that if if you spend enough time on Facebook, like you definitely uh, get smarter um, and, and <laughs> get exposed to all kinds of ideas you never would have really considered uh, on the Ben Shapiro show. <laughs> Well, yeah. Well, what else can you tell us about this uh, this kind benefactor, this big this big donor? <laughs> yeah. Well, so Barry Side, owner of Triplate, he's he's owned that company. Um, he, he he was the sole owner of it. He's been running it since the 1960s. Um, what what we know is that um, he he's been getting just incredibly wealthy. Um, just without without any kind of fanfare at all. Um, he, you know, he was never on like the kind of Forbes list of of uh, billionaires, but we, we know that he was pulling in like, uh, in 2018, he took in $150 million and most of it was from trip light. Um, between 1996 and 2018, uh, he, he pulled in $1.7 billion in income. Um, and while this was all happening, he was becoming this mega donor. Um, we, we know that he gave at least 775 million, uh, in charitable donations over that time. And that's just like, what, what we know of it's possible he was giving more than that because some years he was kind of hitting uh the, the sort of charitable max like the the highest amount that you could actually deduct um and none of that would even include donations to like some of the leo network which are 501c4s like because he wouldn't be able to claim a deduction there um typically speaking so you know we know that um he was private and kind of uncharacteristically generous in giving uh, two conservative causes. Um, you know, we, we do know some of the groups he's funded, um, like the Heartland Institute, which is this kind of like uh, ridiculous right wing climate denial group. It's just kind of notorious for being like a I think they were a front for big tobacco before they were a, a front for uh, the oil and gas industry and climate denial. Um, so we we know that he is a giant donor. And, and you know, now he's he really has given this um unprecedented war chest to uh an operative who is skilled and in a a a tactician and it's you know this this can this is money that will not get spent quickly if they if they you know play play this right with this 1.6 billion dollar donation they will be able to like sit on that money for like potentially forever um but you know if you were to even donate like say 80 million dollars over 20 years like there'd still be money left at, at the end because, you know, you can, you can grow these, like you can, you can grow this pool of money kind of indefinitely. If you, if you like, you could literally just spend the the, the money that you earn in each year and it would still make a, a really substantial impact on our politics and policy. Um, sorry, my mind went like, I'm on like a ton of painkillers from this surgery <laughs> yesterday. I'm, I'm, I told Rob earlier, I'm like a little out of it. Uh, I'm here, but I'm just like a little slow today. They... Sorry, man. I'm getting surgery no. in a few weeks too. I'm Sorry. blasted on painkillers uh, as well, but I didn't have anything wrong with me. I'm just <laughs> yeah, addicted to opioids. That's she like she handed me this the script and she's like, "Here, you're gonna get some T3s." And it's like, really, really need to get those up to Oxy, buddy. <laughs> do they even do they even still make those? I think they probably make a reformulated thing, right? I haven't done recreational no, opioids in like 15 years so i'm I don't sure know. they make them yeah. there's never there's never a bad yeah. time to get back on the horse <laughs> all right let me call my doctor really quick yeah <laughs> dr spachemin uh thank you very much yeah, yeah. no no con- the, the best part about that is just there's no side effects or consequences so 
Absolutely. Yeah. It's yeah. probably the safest thing you could you could do because it's made in a lab. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> these are these are doctors that are doing this. You don't trust science. <laughs> that was like the dumbest thing my my dope addict friends and I would like convince ourselves of, dude, this is so much safer than heroin because you know what you're getting with this. It's yeah. just like a bunch of them are dead now. So <laughs> Oh. Sorry, man. Yeah, really had to take is. that into a dark place there. It, it is a dark thing. It's like yeah. fuck the Sackler family. Yeah. yeah. It's just mass murderers. Yeah. You don't laugh, you'll cry. I'm not crying on the show. That's pathetic. Yeah. <laughs> I wait till um, after the show to do my crying. Thank you. That's Thank just you a much. usual post show thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh but Andrew, you, you know, you were saying earlier you are you you want people to think you're a policy wonk. That's your brand. <laughs> so, <laughs> we we're really hoping you go no, no. Uh just general general reactions to student debt cancellation we've seen a ton of outrage from the right everyone's upset about this this free this giveaway that's going to create dependency on the government i've seen i've seen people just saying like it's unfair because other people have paid back their loans in the past uh you know sean hannity tried to insist that his staff uh were now suffering from green new deal socialism Janine Pirro thought it was unfair because her parents paid for her college and they could have spent their money elsewhere. <laughs> All of these insane reactions from the right. But generally, what, what was your takeaway yesterday when you saw the news that Biden's going to cancel anywhere from ten to 20000 for people? Yeah. Um, I mean, you know, I guess like we've reported on this stuff enough to like, I, I'm definitely a little skeptical that that's like really enough to help some people. I do. I do think that It'll definitely help a lot of students. You know, I, I do think there are people who are definitely trapped in the in the many tens of thousands, potentially much higher, um, uh, bur- like debt loads. Um, so, you know, I guess it's 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 definitely a good step. Um, it's probably should have been more. Um, it it does sound like there are some some additional kind of uh, details here, which I'm not going to pretend to be like a real expert on, but it does sound like um, that. You know, you might that's that students might see the percentage that they have to pay towards their loans um, of their income uh, go down significantly. And that would probably be a, be a very positive development. Um, you know, one of the things I guess I was most encouraged by was they uh, also then uh, renewed the or they extended um, the, the the loan freeze or the, the payment freeze. So that's that's definitely a, a good thing. I guess, you know, there was kind of a question of like, are they just going to cancel 10 K and say like, all right, you got to start paying it back now. Um, because that, that would have, um, probably been a, a huge problem for a lot of people just given the, given the state of the economy right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, I don't know, I guess I won't lie. I've been, <laughs> I've been working more on this story too than, I, I was saying this. I've been I've been focused on uh, our our own reporting more than uh, reading other people's stuff, and that's definitely a, a personal failing on my part um, that I will just own right now. I think from think? someone, I, I think um, for me as someone that is you know not American, and I'm kind of like not so really heard. materially as as I'm reminded often by both Jordan mm-hmm. and you know people in the audience <laughs> and others love to tell me about this. But um, I try not to, I'm kind of cognizant about not being like, oh, this is bullshit. It's not good enough when there's clearly like people that are, that are being helped. And, you know, you're seeing stories on, on Twitter of people that are like the people that are not, like you were saying, and you're stuck in, you know, six figures of debt, but people that have are getting the, the rest of what they had wiped out. And it's, 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 you can see that it's genuinely helpful to people. I, you know, it's, it's it kind of an arbitrary number. And we know that they, if they have the power to do this, they have the power to uh, erase more debt. Um I guess the the kind of as as some one of these outsiders, I guess the the narrative about this that I'm most interested in is whether this, in conjunction with some of the other moves that the, that the Biden administration has been making over the last couple of weeks, whether it's going to be enough to kind of avert the the what seemed to be like a, a foregone conclusion of the right kind of totally rolling them in the coming uh, midterm elections and whether it's going to be enough to convince people that going out and pulling the lever for uh, for the Democrats is a is a worthwhile thing to do. So I'm I'm, in, I'm interested in, in like w- both of you guys, actually, whether you think um, 
whether you think that's going to move the needle in any way. I think because I think one of the things we've been talking about, um, you know, since the since uh, Biden was inaugurated, since the whole election was, you know, they really just haven't done a whole lot of anything. And you had their whole agenda getting stalled out by by Manchin and everything kind of going backwards on a lot of the things that they said they was going to do. It really looked his his approval rating was just completely in the garbage and it really looked like a to, like I was saying a f- total foregone conclusion that they were about to get absolutely rinsed in the coming um, midterms. Now with a, with a few of these things, it's starting to seem like less of a foregone conclusion. So I'm just I'm wondering what whether you guys think this is going to be enough to convince people, especially young people, to go out and vote for Democrats in uh, in the coming midterms. Yeah, I mean, I think I think it it could definitely be like one part of of that calculus changing. There's, there's definitely, it's, there seem to be like a few factors that are probably at play in like, in, uh, Democrats' fortunes being improved, uh, at least a little bit so far, at least on the surface. And, you know, I think one of those is like that they've, you know, it, it seems like some of the Republican candidates, like for Senate, are just complete dog shit. Um, obviously, like, yeah, Dr. That doesn't Oz. Hurt yeah, yeah, it just doesn't hurt. Um, it doesn't hurt to have like an opponent you could just dog walk all the time. Like I think, <laughs> I do think that's like a God. I, that, I mean that that's that's just about as good a fortune as they're gonna get. Um, and then I mean you you, you are seeing some like uh, some murmurings of this that like uh, that it, it it seems like young women are like registering to vote in in much higher numbers now. Yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, so much of that is probably rightfully traced to, um, to the Supreme court's abortion decision. Um, and you know, that's, we saw like, even like in Kansas, that was sort of the takeaway there was that, uh, where, where they saw this, uh, pretty just horrible, um, uh, abortion ballot measure, uh, fail where they were trying to re- basically remove constitutional protections in the state for abortion rights, um, and that, that failed. And, you know, I think that might have been a bit of a harbinger. Um, and we're seeing it, it sounds like, in some of these uh, congressional districts. There's there's definitely rumblings about that, that um, that young women are uh, getting ready to or are registering to vote in disproportionately now compared to the rest of the population. So that's, you know, that's something Democrats have predicted. It always sounded fucking crass, obviously, um, when they were like, oh, well, this might be the best thing that ever happened to Democrats. Like, Sounds yeah. fucking horrible. Sounds absolutely horrible, and, and, and it is horrible. Um, but like, it it does it does seem like it's also happening. And you know, of course, the question there is always going to be like, what's the follow through, right? Like, when when all these people go out and vote Democrat, will there be follow through? So, um, yeah. Now I'm just now I'm just <laughs> rambling. It's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> well, no, it, I mean, definitely in terms of the Roe v. Wade thing, it seems a little like the right sort of played their hand early. Um, yeah. A little too early, and now it's it's it it certainly is going to have a galvanizing effect on people. Yeah, uh, and like you said, as grim and as as crass as it is, I mean. Yeah, I mean the, the one the one thing about the student loan stuff that is interesting is like, um, for s- since last summer, there's been this just like incredible movement um, among the kind of like chattering elite class in D.C. to 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 basically say that. Attempting to give anyone money or make their financial situation better is uh, wrong in yes. an inflationary environment. Is it's uh, cheating? It, <laughs> it's cheating, and it's gonna it's gonna make things worse, et cetera, oh, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. And so, you know, that was um, that that environment definitely still exists, and it's it's what um, you know has led to like we we've done some reporting on this, like the like census numbers show that like 40% of Americans, like a record high, like are now saying, or at least a recent record high in the last several years, um, are, are now saying that it's become uh, difficult, very difficult or somewhat difficult to pay their typical household expenses. So, you know, like these, this, the pundit class really kind of uh, demanded austerity, demanded that, um, that, that workers experience pain. And this is sort of the, the first kind of punch back at that bullshit at that at that like absolutely horrible pundit led assault on on workers and in the populace so that's that's definitely a good thing that's encouraging but like i also you know don't exactly expect them to to continue fighting that uh that strain of thought it it, it would it would be surprising if they if they really took it on uh much further beyond beyond this issue 
it it was funny today also seeing the um seeing like the official white house account doing that thread about republicans complaining about the student debt forgiveness who took those ppp loans and like that is i feel like that is the kind of messaging that they should have been doing you know a, a year ago and it's like it's i guess it's a kind of a better late than never thing that they're finally cluing in that they can um go after uh the right in this in the way that they're doing now mm-hmm. it does seems like it does seems like they're uh, that you know i don't want to i've seen people doing like unironic dark brandon meme posting and stuff i'm not gonna i'm not gonna go that far in praising the whole of the Biden administration but <laughs> it definitely yeah. does seem like they're figuring some stuff out over the last couple of uh weeks and months that they've kind of neglected to uh attempt uh since the since they were like, inaugurated yeah I guess they decided they didn't like have to completely get their shit rocked in in yeah. November. Yeah, turns yeah. out you can just do a couple <laughs> things that are popular with people, and and you're seeing the, the poll numbers go up as well. It's like I wonder if these are related somehow. I don't yeah. know these two things. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we don't need to repeat like the the disaster of the Obama era where we just leaned hard into austerity uh, in his second year of his presidency. That was never like. A necessity that you had to copy that um, yeah. strategy, especially now in in like you know it's still like a pandemic economy. It's it, yeah. it was just a it's a crazy idea, but um. Well, and as like with Obama yeah. too, famously listening to people like Larry Sumner's, who's now complaining about student debt, while Biden, Dark Brandon is saying like, no, we're doing it anyways. We're we're deliberately just ignoring what Larry people like Larry Sumner's are saying, rather than yeah. allowing them to set economic policy. Yeah. The, the story I think we would have done this week, like if I if if I wasn't working on this um, on this dark money stuff is like so someone should really do it free free story idea. Whoever wants to do it, like just collect <laughs> all of the kind of like elite pundits who are speaking out against uh, student debt relief, like just take a look at like the extreme wealth literally all of them come from like every single one of them. I swear if you if you just like. Google for five minutes, you'd be like, oh, wow, that's like a $10 million house. I swear it will happen. And they, of course, they're all like legacy cases and and like, yeah, it, it, at like Ivy League schools. And like, yeah, someone someone should really just do that piece because I think I think it would I think it would really sail. Another question I um, had, because um, like we, we were on a little bit of a hiatus over the summer, um, kind of a sporadic schedule. We never really talked much about the whole uh, Inflation Reduction Act and the way that sort of Build Back Better agenda uh, kind of transformed into that with somehow Joe Manchin coming to the end and saving the day in the end, which feels a little kind of like stage managed to me, but, you know, whatever. But I'm, I'm, I would like to hear um, from you, Andrew, I, again, big wonk, big numbers guy, um, about like what is in this bill because i know it's like in term compared to what biden campaigned on um and the whole build back better agenda that genuinely did have a lot of like pretty transformative and progressive uh policies in there and they they really like what what ended up happening after this kind of like again this kind of kayfabe uh two-year negotiation with uh with joe manchin a lot of it did get watered down it's a, a supposedly this big historic climate legislation that also does have a lot of handouts to fossil fuel companies. I know there is some some decent things in there that will help people. Like, what's what's your read on that? Yeah. Well, this is where I'm going to take off my wonk hat and I'm going to put on my money and politics reporter uh, there you go. <laughs> hat. Like, <laughs> I I think there is a fundamental question about whether you could possibly craft a climate bill that does anything near what's necessary to, uh, you know, preserve um, the, the planet um, and, and, you know, the future of humanity while making the oil industry happy. Yeah. Like, I just... There's not a lot of market-based solutions to this, uh, unfortunately. Yeah. It's just, if this bill was going to cost them money, like, you know, scientists are telling us, like, we need to stop... Stop taking fossil fuels out of the ground. If this bill is not going to cost them money, like, or they, they, they wouldn't be backing if it, they wouldn't be backing this bill if it was going to threaten their business model one iota. It just would not happen. Um, you know, there was all this reporting about how, you know, first off, we saw like companies like Exxon and Shell and BP like come out and praise the bill. 
Um, there was also all this reporting about how Republicans were like sort of like working the phones, trying to get uh, oil companies to speak out against the Inflation Reduction Act. And it just they couldn't find anyone to do it. Um, so I think I think that should really raise like giant alarm bells. And, and anyone who's like who's like pointing at charts is just I don't know, man, like that's that just feels like like you're all getting played. That's that's my that's my real rough take on it. It's just like. You cannot craft necessary climate bill or necessary climate legislation that pleases the oil industry. It's not going to happen. Um, you know that some of the other things like that the that the bill does. You know, you look at you look at the like drug the drug pricing provisions, which were watered down, watered down, and watered down over over the course of like all year last year by uh, senators like Kirsten Cinema. Um, and, and, you know, there were like a few, uh, kind of rogue, uh, pharma Dems in the, in the house as well. Um, that bill was negotiated down, negotiated down, and they managed to strip out some more stuff in the, in the process with the parliamentarian. Um, so now, you know, like we're going to see a bill that allows Medicare to negotiate drug prices for the first time, but not till 2026 and only a handful of drugs and not drugs that uh, have exclusivity AKA not the drugs that are going to be the very most expensive drugs. Like just they've negotiated it down, successfully negotiated it down in a big way. And and you know what? You still saw the pharmaceutical industry. Jordan, you're in DC. I'm sure you've seen this. You still saw the pharmaceutical industry just tearing into the bill every day and spending mm -hmm. probably tens of millions of dollars on TV ads and funding all these conservative groups that also spent, spent a lot of money uh, tearing into the bill. Even though it yeah. is not going to cost pharma much money, so to me, I find that very instructive. The oil industry literally rallied around the Inflation Reduction Act, and the pharmaceutical industry, despite almost completely gutting the drug pricing provisions, still spent a ton of money against it. And that's because, like to me, these industries, if if the, if legislation is going to cost them money, they will oppose it. They just will. And if, if they're if they're saying this bill is great, don't expect that it's going to threaten their business model. It won't. Yeah, I, I saw those ads um, from Big Pharma. I think that's what that's one of the ones I referenced earlier because I just I, I just saw it a couple of weeks ago. Uh, I can't remember exactly what they said, but I remember being like confused by what the message was saying. They just wanted <laughs> they just wanted senior citizens to call Congress and be angry. Um because they will. I mean, this, this, that, that, that's a population that votes, that pays attention, relatively speaking, and will get mad if you fuck up their Social Security or their Medicare. Um, they'll get mad. So they're trying to manipulate uh, boomers. I, I mm -hmm. looked up the group, and I, I do remember it was like a front group. Um, but the, the, the reaction to, you know, David pointed it out. Uh, the lever did really good coverage of this. You talked about it on your call-in show. Just asking the question, why is big oil celebrating this bill? That's a simple question for what is you know, framed as the biggest climate bill in U.S. history and one of the biggest efforts by a single nation uh, ever. If the oil industry is gleeful about it, that should raise suspicion to any reporter. Not a great sign. But instead, sign. you had... Yeah, exactly. You had people like scolding David, scolding the lever, uh, you know, dismissing it as angry online leftists, uh, casting doubt on uh, the claims, say, suggesting that it was ludicrous to even point this out. But it just seems really suspicious that the perpetrators of climate change, the biggest perpetrators of climate change, are excited about a climate bill and you you could very clearly see it expands oil and gas production it has you know a, a ton of provisions for them protects their industry in exchange for some other things and that's why they're excited it's okay and it should be you know you should point that out if you're covering a bill of this magnitude and i just it really represented a failure in the media and a failure of reporters roles to be critical and afflict the comfortable uh, in, in how they covered something like this because they just took the the Biden administration framework uh, and messaging and ran with it and tried to scold anyone who cast out on it at the beginning. And then over time, over the, over the next couple of weeks, you started to see stories in legacy institutions, the Times, the Post, uh, Associated Press, pointing this out. 
later on pointing out, oh, actually, this might not be as good as they initially said it was going to be. So, you know, kudos to, to David and the Lever for pointing this out early, but everybody, you, it shouldn't have been just them. It shouldn't have been just you guys. It should be everybody pointing this out. Well, that's I, the whole thing about the, like, baffling. The, that's like the the most historic, largest climate bill in American history. Like, that's an, that's an insanely low bar to clear, you yes. know? Right. That doesn't necessarily right. mean uh, that there's anything good. Is it, like, just to, just to hear the other side of that, like, is there anything in there that in terms of like all the things that they're celebrating that will be helpful in, in that. Like, obviously it's not going to end the global capitalism, which would probably be the main thing that is, uh, <laughs> is just creating the crisis and, and uh, the worsening IPCC it. explicitly said. Yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> I mean, but is there, does it do anything that's helpful at all or what's, what else is in there? It's, it's all sort of a bet. Like there, there, there is money like that's going towards renewables in it, but it's, tied to like oil and gas leasing um there's additionally this like potential mansion permitting deal that sounds potentially really awful that sound that sounds like an actual like catastrophe if it's if it's allowed to advance um it would you got to assume it would probably kind of wreck any of the 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 supposed gains being made here um you know the the build seems to be a pretty big bet also on like carbon capture technology which you know it's just often that gets used by oil companies to just pump more <laughs> pump more oil like so you know it's i don't know some of my colleagues are a little less skeptical than me um and look maybe they know more than me uh, about this topic but um it's just you know the truth is i don't think that that the people who were like yelling at david really care about like the actual policy really at all like it just you know, that's not what it's about, right? Like, it's it's really the, like, liberal pundit class thinks that Joe Biden needs a win because, like, his numbers have been in the tank. Like, he needs a win. Democrats need a win. And, like, why won't you give it to them? They, they finally got Manchin on board with a bill that he wrote, you know, after, after literally he... I mean, he had negotiated, like, the Build Back Better Act, like, effectively, like, for most of last year. It was basically his bill that, that, he, that he pulled out of. Um, so it's, you know, I think you have people here who just want to see Joe, Joe Biden have just not be, you know, a completely incompetent bumbling president who, who loses the midterms in historic fashion. I really, I really think that's the, the primary driver of, of so much of that hate and hate, hate that went towards David. Um, yeah, I don't know. I guess I don't have much more to say about it in that, like, I just really think that's what it is. These people don't really care about policy. They probably think that they're going to be insulated from uh, from the worst effects of climate change. And, like, maybe that's true. Maybe they all do live in a kind of ivory tower. But, you know, D.C. is flood prone. Like, it's it, it is it can definitely be affected by climate change. And I'm not sure that that uh, pundits like Matt Iglesias know that um, it's just I don't know. They just they know they'll have the means to move, even if it leaves, you know, even if it means abandoning their home, they can at least move somewhere. Yeah. So they could always move one floor up and like, you know, if you have to <laughs> yeah. step through some water, like whatever. Yeah. <laughs> it's just like Venice then. It's just like Venice. <laughs> it's romantic, if yeah. anything. And like Ben Shapiro said, service. just when your home is underwater, you just sell it. You just sell it to someone else. <laughs> Get out of sell. there. Yeah. Yeah. No That's problem. That's the easiest time to sell it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Talking about uh, uh, underwater mortgages there, huh? Uh-huh. Am I right, folks? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't think Ben has a mortgage on his, wherever no. he lives in Nashville. I, I think. don't think so. There was, there was actually a good, a good story on, uh, on, on Ben Shapiro today about um, the, the, the fracking brothers who uh, funded him, um, funded his, his climate denialist empire, um, the, the Wilkes brothers. It's, yeah, it's definitely that, worth yeah. checking out. Yeah. Well, it's it's hilarious, right? Like that whole the whole Daily Wire media empire is is basically just like the PR arm of of like fracking companies. Like that's essentially what all that that right wing media is, you know? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's I mean, kind of like the funniest thing about their kind of whole thoughts about like welfare and this idea of like paying off people's student loans. Like, yeah, all of these people work for like in the most subsidized like make work jobs ever. Just complete. Like just completely unnecessary jobs that are that are financed by big industry secretly that we just never really know about. 
Um, and that's, that's, you know, Ben Shapiro's got his own little outlet, but that's like really the case with all of these, uh, elite conservative kind of beltway magazines too, you know, like, com- like groups like, or companies like Reason and like National Review and, you know, really na- pick, pick one and, you know, pick anyone at random. And it has been funded by, um, by big industry and, and, uh, conservative billionaires who, who, just want to hear people espouse the same thoughts that they have. It's, 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 it is, you know, it's always been known as like wing nut welfare, but it is, it is truly a, an apt description. We really do have to start getting some dark money billionaires to pitch in something yep. on what mm-hmm. we're doing I'm here. I'm calling Arabella advisors yeah. saying, Hey, what's up? I want in. <laughs> you up? Yeah. What, what, <laughs> yeah. Whatever you're doing, I want in. <laughs> yeah. We're going to pivot. We're going to pivot hard in the. <laughs> yeah. What's funny is you, year you, three. You hear the Leo Group talking about Arabella Advisors and like, oh, the 1630 fund and uh, the new venture fund. Like, they they kind of copied a little bit of the business model from from them from from Arabella. But like th- those groups, like there there's no comparison. Like there's like 60 organizations that are run out of uh, the 1630 fund. Like it is right or out of the 1630 fund a new venture fund it's like really anyone can show up there and be like i have like fifty thousand dollars from a donor like can can i start a non like can i be housed under your nonprofit and run an independent organization there and they're like yeah i guess like that's how that whole system works like the, the leo network is like highly centralized like the it's it's just there's like no comparison and god i like you have to know that they're just like cracking up as they're like getting reporters to repeat this shit every day <laughs> um the uh i can't remember who posted it there was a really funny like flow chart that looked like just kind of a conspiracy web uh that had arabella advisors as the center point the other day and uh one of the one of the lines that was really funny was just uh the white house with the line to the supreme court like a point like the white house is connected to the supreme court is this like big reveal eric erickson was the one who did it um and it all flowed in and out of arabella advisors and it's just like first of all who really controls the supreme court right now it's not biden but also like your big bombshell is that these two institutions have some sort of tangential relationship this is great research way to go you know i I guess i didn't even say that like arabella like what they do for those organizations is like administrivia like the reason you want to go under one of these like fiscal sponsor organizations is so you don't have to hire like a bookkeeper and like an hr person like it's just it's it's sort of like i can just set up shop in a in a new or or, and not have to create like an, an independent entity like that's the whole purpose of it and like i think arabella like every time they get all these like this these press hits and like these inquiries they have to be like like what did we do like they're literally just handling administration. Like it's not. Mm-hmm. It's just not a. It's not a fair comparison. And like I guess I guess we did. We we had to include uh, Leo's quote to the Times in in our piece because he didn't give us a quote. Um, like they they didn't respond to to comment like quickly to us when we had to had to turn our story out very quickly. Um, but like it's it is it is just rank bullshit. Like there is no comparison between his group and Arabella Advisors and that. Like he is, he is like one political operative steering a, a ship that has immense influence. And these groups on the left, like, okay, fine. They can raise money. They, they can all raise money under one roof. There's very limited transparency. Um, but it's, you know, it's just the, the impact is, is so negligible that it's, that it's just, it, it's ridiculous to even compare them. Right. Right. Yeah. The, the, the fiscal sponsorship thing is really, frustrating um it's just a really frustrating world to navigate if you try to start something anything in response to a a news event a social issue whatever and it's rapid response and you want to do this on your own i'm not saying that's everybody who goes to arabella advisors but like just generally speaking and say you want to like raise money to have a protest or something you saw this a lot in early 2017 when all of these people Mm -hmm. had these big marches uh in response to the first you know, 100 days or so of the Trump administration, the tax march, the women's march, climate march, all these different things. If you're doing this on your own, you're not like it's not an organization doing this and then trying to get people there. I don't think people realize just how difficult and timely uh, it is to start a 501c3, 501c4. Like this is the work that goes into it. You have to have a board. You have to have 
you know, a, a legal team and the, all these documents prepared, bank accounts set up. Fiscal sponsorship is just, okay, yeah, like we'll take a cut of your donations mm-hmm. and we'll provide all of these services for you. Um, and it's just, it saves, it saves a ton of time. Even having lawyers is extremely expensive. Yeah. Uh, yeah. It's, Look, it's, I, st- I started a 501c4 like a few years ago. What a giant pain in the ass. And like, we didn't even raise like any money. Like I've, I've at least gotten to file these like tax returns where like you just say like, oh, we didn't raise $50,000. Like that's all you have to do. Like <laughs> still, still honestly, one of the worst mistakes I've ever made. Cause like I cannot deal with the paperwork. Like it is just not mm-hmm. easy. It is not easy. And, and the truth is if we had had $50,000 and we're like, Hey, Arabella, like we, we'd like to go join your outfit. It would have, it would have been much 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 easier but you know no one no one offered us that kind of money sadly um so that is i guess that is that is a problem that i that i get to deal with uh, for myself in the future <laughs> so, sooner than later too honestly i really i really need to close that down and never think about it again because it is just sitting around accruing fees and, and bullshit that i don't need to deal with well speaking of closing it down andrew <laughs> Thank what you so pro. much. Yeah, there we go. Andrew, thank you so much for joining the program today. It was great to talk to you about all this stuff. Thanks for <laughs> thanks for coming on to, to to chat with us. Thanks so much. Thanks for uh thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Thanks for letting me rant tonight cuz uh it's it's very hot in this in this room. Um so I I I needed to uh, to to let it out. Good. Where can people find uh more from you and your work? Sure. Um so our website is levernews.com. You can follow us uh, on Twitter at, at levernews. You can follow me on Twitter at Andrew Perez DC. Um, we reported this story um, on uh, this $1.6 billion historic donation uh, with ProPublica. And so you could find, a, find it on their website as well. And you can also find that on Apple News, where I, I hear that it went gangbusters. And if you want to keep bringing clicks that way, I, I highly encourage it. But also visit our website too, please. <laughs> Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Insurgents. Please remember to subscribe over at theinsurgents.substack.com. Find the podcast on all your favorite podcast apps. And please remember to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It's very helpful and we appreciate it a lot. But please, again, don't mention Ken Klippenstein in the review. He is banned from the show. It's a lifetime ban. So please do not mention him in the review. And we'll be back later this week with more of the content that you know and love. Goodbye.